right, and now we're going to have Hassam tell us about how you can save lives with Julia. Yeah, sorry for the overly dramatic uh, title. Uh, it's a bit more, more modest than that. But I'd like to start by showing you some molecules. Does, does anyone in the audience know one of these molecules? Raise of hands if you do. We only have 10 minutes, so don't be shy. <laughs> one is enough. Do, do you recognize any of them? Okay, I'll, I'll make it a little simpler. So, um, <laughs> of course, you've heard of cocaine and heroin, classic. But, of course, uh, meth, you've watched Breaking Bad, probably. And maybe you went to a party and uh, got to know MDMA. But there's one, you can see, but, oh, there's one, you can see from the italics that that's the focus, is fentanyl. Fentanyl is a newer name. I don't know how many people in the audience have heard of it, but it's something that's on the radar with uh, a lot of uh, health organizations and uh, drug control. And um, so, uh, yeah, just a chemical curiosity. It's cool that a lot of these molecules have similar structures, uh, except for cocaine. All of them have this like, common unit. But anyway, moving on. Um, fentanyl, <laughs> fentanyl and its derivatives, they're just like, it's, it's just a huge family. And what's interesting about them is, first of all, they're simpler than certain drugs like heroin that has a really complicated structure, but also comparing them to um, other opioids, so like morphine, which is used in healthcare for you know, making you feel less pain. So if, if morphine is 1x effectiveness, like you need 10 milligrams for someone to just forget their pain, and heroin is like four to five, now let's look at the, these numbers. So for fentanyl, it's 50 to 100. And look over there, carfentanil is 10,000 to 100,000 more, X more effective. So basically, it's a molecule that's engineered to just bind to the mu opioid receptor in your brain. Like just, it's, it's a chemi chemical molecule engineering, pretty much. And so you can see that the, the dose is so low, so it's it really is easy to overdose on this stuff, right? Like uh, one milligram could easily kill you. So um, this is actually from the news. Uh, it's kind of cut off, but this is um, the June of 2016. And this photo was taken in Vancouver, where I used to live. Um, and you see these people in their hazmat suits. What do you think happened? So apparently, somebody from China decided to send a kilogram of carfentanil to Canada. And this, this is enough to kill 50 million people. Like, the entire population of Canada can be, can be just erased, basically. And, and this is the list of all, well, this is a partial list of all the known fentanyl derivatives. Some of them might be even more potent. Right? So with this proliferation of drug molecules, you can see that there's a desire to basically be able to tell what's going on. When you look at an unknown sample, so on the street to be able to tell what's inside it. And so after grad school, I was poor and I was looking for a job and I got hired by Health Canada. So I, got, I had the pleasure of working with a lot of really nice people, including these two gentlemen. So the guy in the middle is, uh, was my boss, uh, Rick. And over there is a machine called the NMR machine, which is like an MRI machine, but for molecules. So you can see it's a giant chunk of metal and there's liquid nitrogen going inside to cool down the electronics to make it less noisy. And it's, it's a really marvelous sort of equipment. And uh, what it does basically is if you take a molecule, I don't know why my slides are cut off at the bottom. Maybe I can maybe just like scroll. There we go. Okay. So, <clears throat> so if you take a molecule, it will, you give it the, the, the compound and it gives you a spectrum. And this spectrum has a horizontal axis called the chemical shift, which is a sort of a convention to measure, um, basically, if you have the, the hydrogen atoms in the molecule, how far they resonate from a <coughs> reference frequency, right? So using that, every type of proton or every, every type of hydrogen in the molecule gives you a fingerprint. And chemists are really good at looking at a molecule and telling you what the, the spectrum would look like. They've like, trained for years to find out find out how to do this, or going back to so looking at the spectrum and tell, uh, telling you what, what sort of molecule you're looking at. Now, there is, there is a challenge. The challenge is that any sample that you will get is going to be a complicated mixture. So uh, normally, a drug is fairly, drugs are fairly 
potent. So a, a pill-sized sample will have lots of filler material, so caffeine, uh, lactose, stuff like that, right? So when you put all those in the same sort of sample, of course, the spectra interact. They usually just add up, but there's, it, it can do more complicated things. So if you take it, the, the individual spectra, they all look really nice, but when you add them up together, you have this you know, just a mess. And like no chemist in this universe can look at that and say, oh, of course, this is like uh, this much lactose, this much uh, math, MDMA, whatever, right? But for computers, actually, it's not that hard. So basically, that's what we did. If you look at each of those individual spectra that I just added up, in the simplest possible case, and this is like maybe worse for 10% of the cases, you can basically make a linear combination of those and come up with the uh, spectrum of the sample. So basically, really all you need to do is a, do a least square sort of uh, solution of the sample with respect to your reference spectra. And as I said, uh, this only works for 10% of the cases because the molecules interact with each other, the spectra start to shift around, so some, some parts go, uh, some parts, uh, the, the shapes even change, and if you have really exotic samples, it, it can be almost impossible to tell if you really have uh, well, basically, if you don't know what you put in, it's impossible to tell from the spectrum. Uh, so what we did reiterate on this design many, many times. So this was his initial incarnation, and we went on to make it more and more fancy, putting in basically domain knowledge, you know, like from chemistry, from chemical knowledge, to be able to really analyze these samples. And I think that it was a, a fairly successful thing. So yeah, in Julia code, if you wanted to, express that is so simple, right? It's beautiful, um, really lovely. Uh, and so I just want to add two more things. One is how do we integrate this Julia code into their existing workflow, especially knowing that this is government, they have a lot of uh, requirements. So the, the GUI that uh, the analysts use to look at your uh, samples is this proprietary GUI, and it's, it's just a giant monolith uh, written in Java called Topspin. So initially, when I started working there, uh, I knew that Topspin has a, uh, a, a Jython uh, sort of scripting interface, which is amazing. Uh, so I basically, uh, the Jython doesn't have NumPy or anything, right? so you can't do all that stuff. But I basically pulled in some jar files from Apache Commons and tried to kind of do that. It's very, very painful, very slow. So then what I did was basically just take the data and uh, work on my library, which is called NMR.jl, in the end, just uh, make, make Topspin talk to my library over a TCP socket, only send in over the, the file name, and then the rest would be handled by the, the Julia library. And finally, for deployment, just put in a virtual machine, and then make a nice Jupyter sort of control panel to stop and start analysis, that sort of thing. Um, so what did I find was really nice about Julia, about well, multiple dispatch is amazing, it's, uh, it's very fast, and I, I like that you get native threading. We used that, and it, it, was, it was very useful. Um, it'd be nice to get faster compilation, like some syntactic sugar around threads, and, and of course, now we have new pa the new package and revised, so it was missing back then, but it's really good to have that. So uh, just when I landed in London, I got this email from my boss, and um, I'd say, I'd say it, it's not unfair to say it was a successful experiment. So I'm really thankful to Julia and all the, uh, the ecosystem, the community that made that. And uh, the project is on GitHub. I hope that somebody um, looks at it and that we get some collaborations. Uh, so thank you. Hi, uh, do you plan to extend that to other types of spectroscopy? Well, um, to be honest, the, the functionality is fairly, fairly small at the point. Like, are you talking about like EPR or like mass spec or something like that? Um, yeah, so there's some general purpose uh, stuff that's implemented. Um, I think maybe we could just have Julia MR instead of NMR, some sort of organization that can make make more composable packages for that. So it sounds pretty great. So, oh, yeah. Uh, so now you have uh, given components and you're fitting the, the mixture onto the known components to identify which, which one you have. Yes. Could you imagine having 
partially this, but also discovering what components are in a mixture or well, through some principal component analysis or things like this? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Uh, what's, what's kind of hard is when you mix chemicals, the peaks start moving around and that can, the, the, the final spectrum can start looking quite different from what you put in, right? So uh, I think we had this case where if you add a lot of uh, caffeine, which is a very common cutting agent, or it just really messes with your spectrum, right? So uh, at that point, it becomes a question of whether this is a new compound or like something that's really messed up by the caffeine. But you can do a probabilistic approach, which is something that I'm actually thinking about now, is to basically be able to uh, uh, come up with a reasonable process for generating uh, new spectra and then decomposing based on those. Thank you. All right, thank you.